In this video, I'm going to talk more about the motivation for applying data analysis methods that are based on inspecting or assuming that there are rhythms in the data set. So this is spectral analyses, time frequency analyses, narrowband connectivity analyses, and so on. And actually, I'm going to start the lecture by talking a little bit more about phase-locked and non-phase-locked components of a signal, which is a concept that I introduced in the previous video. So here we have, this is a, a slide from this paper here. This is illustrating some time domain data. Again, this is simulated data. That's why it looks so beautiful. And what they are showing here is the distinction between what they call evoked and induced. I prefer the terms phase-locked and non-phase-locked. I think these terms are a little bit easier to remember, and they're also a little bit more kind of sensible and linked to what's actually happening in the signal. Anyway, so here they call evoked. I would call this phase-locked. Here they call it induced. I and other people as well would call this non-phase-locked. And what you can see is that the evoked response has the exact same timing, not only in terms of the energy, but also in terms of the exact phases. So this signal is going up and down with the same timing on all three of these trials. And this induced or non-phase locked and also non-time locked response has a different time course on each trial. So again, this is like the plot that I showed in the, the end of the previous video. When you compute the time domain average, the ERP, here this is ERF, this would be for a magnetic field, that's the MEG equivalent of an ERP. You can still see this first evoked or phase-locked response, but this is averaged out for the same reason that I explained in the previous video. Here you see a time frequency analysis of the ERP, and you only see this one response here in the beginning, you don't see any representation of these induced responses. And that's because the reason why you don't see these events in this time frequency plot is that this is the time frequency plot of this signal, this ERP. In contrast, the way that we are going to be doing time frequency analyses that you will learn in this course is we don't do an event uh, or a time frequency plot on the event related potential. Instead, we take the time frequency analysis of each trial separately. So this is the time frequency analysis of trial one for trial two and trial three. And then here you see that these narrowband frequency rhythms here are present in the time frequency plot here. And then what you see here is the average of these three individual plots. So time frequency analysis of each individual trial and then average over all of those time frequency power spectra. And then you see both the uh, phase locked response and the non-phase locked response in the same signal. So by applying these time frequency analyses, we are extracting more information from the signal than what we would get just from the ERP. So here you see a table illustrating what you can measure when activity is time-locked versus non-time-locked and phase-locked versus non-phase-locked. Now, this distinction between, uh, or these terms, phase-locked and non-phase-locked and time-locked and non-time-locked, these are terms that are only really useful to discuss when you have a trial-based experiment design. So that is an experiment design where there is something that you can call a time zero. This might be an external event like uh, a, a picture comes on the computer screen or there's a sound that's played or maybe there's a somatosensory stimulation so there's you know a little mechanism that's vibrating the finger for example so in these kinds of trial based designs where you have a time zero to time lock the data to then you can have dynamics that are both time locked and phase locked and here you will see that the trial average shows the response in the uh, time domain and also in the time frequency domain. So when something is phase locked and time locked, then you will see it in the time frequency analysis and you will see it in the event related potential. If something is time locked, if the activity is time locked but non phase locked, then you get this situation that I showed at the end of the previous uh, video where you have all the individual trials show this clear pattern of increased energy but the event-related potential goes to zero 
because the activity is non-time locked, uh, or well, it, it's time locked, but the, the exact timing of the phases of the oscillation are different on different trials. So that's called non-phase locked. So for a pattern like this, the ERP will not be able to measure those dynamics. A time frequency response will. And here we get to a case where you have non-time locked and also non-phase locked activity. This is like what I showed here in this previous slide, where the uh, signal happens at different times on different trials. So here I'm just lagging them by a little bit, so they're overlapping a little bit. So again, this sort of pattern is not going to be visible in the ERP. And whether it's visible in the time frequency response depends a little bit on how non-time locked they are. If they're really spread apart and you don't have that many trials, then non-time locked activity will also be invisible in the time frequency power spectrum. So I'd like to now spend the rest of the video talking about why it's important to do these time frequency analyses. It's not only about uh, phase locked and non-phase locked activity. It's also because it is well known that the brain exhibits a lot of rhythmic neural activity. So at many different spatial scales, at many different temporal scales of the brain, many different ways of measuring the brain, you will often find that the brain has very strong patterns of rhythmic activity. You can see this here just looking at the raw signal. I'll show a few more examples of raw traces in a few slides. You can see it when looking at time frequency plots that there are narrow band features in the time frequency plot. I will talk more in a few videos, it might even be the next video, uh, about how to interpret these time frequency plots and what to look for in time frequency plots. Here you see uh, what's called a static power spectrum and you see that there are bumps, there are peaks in the spectrum indicating the presence of rhythmic or oscillatory activity. Here you see an even more striking example of bumps or uh, the presence of oscillations in a time frequency response or a, a spectral profile. Broadly speaking, there are two different families of methods for studying the brain. One I refer to as imaging and the other I refer to as electrophysiology. Now these two are kind of overlapping. They're actually not so easy to distinguish from each other. But broadly speaking, imaging involves taking pictures of the brain you might get pictures at a kind of macroscopic scale like with fMRI or at a microscopic scale like this where each of these little circles with a little tail on it is a, uh, is a is cell, is a brain cell. So imaging gives you like snapshots of the brain and electrophysiology of course is what we're focusing on in this course that's about recording the, electro, the electrical activity of the brain. And again, this can be at a sort of meso to macroscopic scale like EEG. Here you see a happy research participant, this is actually me. Uh, or it can be very um, fine-grained and invasive. Here you see a really, really closely zoomed in picture of one cell. This is a neuron cell body. And here you see the tip of the tiny, tiny electrode that is measuring the electrical activity from this one cell. Now, the reason why this distinction between imaging and electrophysiology isn't really a perfect distinction is that with imaging, you also very often, not always, but you often get a time series data. So you can do time series analyses on imaging data. And of course, with electrophysiology, you can also produce images like topographical maps that you learned about a few videos ago. So the distinction isn't totally clear cut, but nonetheless, Mostly what people use imaging for is different from what people use electrophysiology for. So with imaging, usually you're asking the question is, you know, is this part of the brain active or not active during this particular part of a cognitive task? Or you know, is brain activity in this region or this other region different in a group of patients versus a group of uh, healthy controls? So to me, this is like, looking in the brain for radios and just seeing if these radios are turned on or turned off. So you might come to the conclusion based on your imaging data that, you know, during this one particular kind of cognitive process or perceptual, emotional, linguistic process, whatever you're studying, there's a radio that's turned on in this part of the brain and the radio in this part of the brain is turned off. 
With electrophysiology, the information that you get is a little bit richer and it has a meaningful temporal structure. And that temporal structure is very often rhythmic, like the patterns that you see here. So here you see, this would be like uh, the, the information that's being transmitted. And this would be how that can be expressed using AM or amplitude modulated. And this would be FM or frequency modulated. And in fact, both of these kinds of carrier signals are present in brain activity. We are gonna be focusing more on AM signals in the brain than on FM, but uh, there is also evidence that the brain can uh, process and transmit and organize information through time-varying fluctuations in the instantaneous frequency. All right, but I think this gives you a bit of a sense of what we are looking for in electrophysiology, why we are focusing on data analysis methods that allow us to capture and isolate and quantify rhythmic patterns of temporal activity. So here you see a picture of the uh, light spectrum and various kinds of information that's contained in different parts of the frequency spectrum. So here on the x-axis is frequency. This is in hertz, but you can see that these numbers get to be really, really large. So these are incredibly fast fluctuations. Here is the narrow range of visible light spectrum that we can see. Here you see the radio spectrum. This is FM and AM. And the reason why I show this is because when you look at a brain frequency spectrum, you see that there are similar kinds of uh, organization principles as what you see with the light spectrum. So the idea is that, you know, there are these narrow ranges in the entire spectrum where information is organized. Now, part of these narrow ranges come from biology, the biology of our eyes and our visual systems. And part of this narrow uh, focus in this spectrum comes from our choices as, as engineers, as people. We invented radios to have this particular uh, range of spectrum. In the brain, it's more, it's closer to the biological limits, but you can see that there is not going to be um, necessarily interesting activity at every single possible frequency. Instead, the information in the brain appears to be organized into narrow peaks in this spectrum. So this plot goes from zero up to 50 hertz. That's actually off of this range, but if they would have continued this scale by two more ticks, we would have actually seen the brain spectrum on this plot. So this is 10 to the two. The next tick here, well, this would be 10 to the three. And then here, this tick, which would be approximately here, that would be 10 to the one. And then over here, I guess somewhere would be 10 to the zero. And 10 to the one is 10 hertz here. This peak in brain activity at 10 hertz would appear on this spectrum at somewhere around here. So still, you know, not so far away on this log scale from radio waves and the visible light spectrum. So I think that's pretty interesting because it tells you that there is something fundamental about the organization of information over time or over space where rhythms and narrow activity, narrow band activity is important. So we see that in uh, nature, we see that in biology, we see that even, you know, in our own engineered devices, and we see that in the brain, which is currently a biological device, and who knows at some point in the future, maybe we will transition into brains that are uh, human engineered devices. But anyway, so here in this plot, I show that these are sine waves going up and down. So this kind of motivates the use of techniques like the Fourier transform and wavelet convolution, narrowband filtering to isolate sinusoidal-like features in the uh, brain signal. And so I want to take a moment to talk about that assumption because when you look at brain data, when you have very high signal-to-noise, really good quality data, you can actually see the oscillations in the data itself. However, you can also see that these brain oscillations are not necessarily sinusoidal. Well, in all of these particular cases that they uh, highlighted in this paper, they are definitely non-sinusoidal. So this is not an exhaustive list of all brain uh, arrhythmic patterns of brain activity, but it does show that you see several clear examples of how brain activity can be rhythmic, but non-sinusoidal.
Here you see another example. This is from human EEG. This is from rat local field potential. So this is recorded outside the brain in a human. This is recorded in a rodent with an electrode that was implanted directly into the brain. And you see also very strong patterns of rhythmic activity. And you see also that they are not necessarily sine waves. Nonetheless, if activity is rhythmic, it doesn't have to be sinusoidal for the methods that you will learn about in this course to be valid and applicable. So you can see that despite these signals being non-sinusoidal, they still have narrow representations in the spectrum. You are going to learn a lot more about these kinds of non-stationarities and non-sinusoidalities and what effects they have on the representation of the signal in the frequency domain and in the time domain. That's going to be a big topic in, uh, I think it's towards the end of the next section on static spectral analyses. So I hope you found this video interesting and informative. I talked a little bit more about time-locked and, and phase-locked and non-phase-locked components of a signal, and I spent quite a bit of time motivating the use of a data analysis methods that are based on highlighting or identifying rhythmic features in the data, and that is because many features of the uh, EEG and LFP signal, the electrical activity from the brain, is very strongly rhythmic. In the next video, I'm going to talk more about time frequency plots and how to interpret and evaluate time frequency plots. So I look forward to seeing you then.